course I'm going to come. Okay. Are we live? Okay. Fantastic. Folks, um, this is the new debate series. We've done this in the past before, uh, different topics. You're going to see a lot of different debates that we'll do. But today's debate is over drugs, the legalizing of drugs. On one end, we brought two qualified folks to do this debate, and I'll introduce them individually so you know who they are. On one end, who is all against drugs, former DEA Hector Bereles, who we've had him on before. We got a few million views when we had him on, and we talked about a complete different story with Kiki Camanera. That conversation was a different conversation. It may come up. He, he is known as the Elliot Ness of DEA. That's pretty much who he is and what he's done. Uh, he's a former DEA supervisor and special agent with 30 years' extensive experience in counterterrorism and narcotics enforcement. He's recognized as one of the most highest decorated drug enforcement agents in the history of the Bureau. He received the Federal Bar Association Medal of Valor, the Federal Executive Board Chairman's Special Award, and is credited for his handling and solving of the kidnap, torture, and murder of undercover DEA agent Kiki Camarena by drug traffickers in Guadalajara, Mexico. So that is Hector, who is going to defend why drugs should be illegal. Now, on the complete opposite side... All the way from California is uh, none other than Lieutenant Diane Goldstein, fully qualified. This is her background, 21-year veteran of law enforcement, nationally recognized speaker, writer, and guest lecturer on criminal justice and drug policy reform. 1983, she joined, she joined the Redondo Beach Police Department in California as a patrol officer, later served as a school resource officer, investigator, sergeant, the special investigation unit, and became the first female lieutenant in the department while serving as a division commander in the traffic bureau and community policing and patrol divisions before retiring in 2004. She continued getting educated. She went back to school. I think you just got your MBA and you've gotten a, a few degrees the last couple of years here, 2017 being one of them. And she is now part of LEAP, which used to be called Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Today, it's Law Enforcement Action Partnership. And Diane was appointed as the group's executive director in 2021. Executive director is like the CEO of a company. It's somebody that runs the show. She's the boss. So she is for figuring out a sensible way of legalizing drugs. So having said that, Thank you so much for agreeing to do this debate. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yes. It's, it's my honor to be here actually with Hector because I think we actually agree more than disagree in many aspects. Really? Are you trying to charm him or are you, are you, you really fully agree with that? No, you know what? There, it, I think it's both that okay. I am trying okay. to charm him, <laughs> but it's also that we do. Okay. Well, I, I think uh, I learned through debate. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a family where it was debate. Sometimes we went across the debate, which, you know, we don't need to do that here. You guys right. are friendly with each other. But I learned through debate, whether it's faith, religion, politics, business, finance, uh, it, no matter what it is, it's helped. So I know at the end of the day, the audience is going to win today listening to the two of you. So before we get into it, I have a handful of topics and questions that I'm going to address with the both of you and we'll get through. I have statistics that has to do with the difference between cigarettes and weed and opioids and ecstasy and cocaine. And we're going to cover all of that stuff on, right. you know, the legalizing of it, why some things are not that uh, threatening, but why are we so worried about it? And then maybe there's going to be some solutions at the end of it. So before we get started, uh, Lieutenant Golson, if you don't mind starting first, taking two minutes sure. of how you came to your position, give your case, and then we'll go to your next Hector. So I'm going to start by pointing out something in Hector's book that really touched me because this was really important. Is, you know, Hector, in your book, you recognize the contradiction and the disconnect between our drug policy and the infinite loop of violence that it causes in our society. That's really critical for our audiences to know that there's other ways to combat violence. And here's the where we want the same things in this discussion. We both want an effective drug policy that reduces the harms of substance use disorder, prevents violence, and most important, saves lives. We can agree on that, right, Hector? Yes, I do. I agree with you. Police professionals here and abroad recognize that we can no longer rely on an arrest as a means to address a public health overdose epidemic. Saving lives and reducing crime is not mutually exclusive. Our drug policy has made it mutually exclusive going back to you know, the modern day 1970s when Richard, Richard Nixon declared the war on drugs. 
Law enforcement today requires a reset into 21st century policing that links evidence-based empirical practices between public health and the police. To save lives, we must honor its sanctity. And I think we can agree on that, too. Yes, I do. In 2013, I wrote an article to honor fallen officers in the war on drugs. Since the inception of the drug war, we have sent law enforcement into harm's way to achieve an ideological goal of a drug-free America and world that we will never achieve. I use drugs every day. A couple cups of coffee, glass of wine. I don't smoke cigarettes, but we label drugs wrong, whether they're illicit or licit. Everyone in America uses drugs. Okay. Dissent is difficult today, but necessary in law enforcement. Yep. We should talk about policing and ask ourselves if what we are doing is the right thing or not. Are our current practices the best practices to solve a problem? I'd say it's not. From September 2020 to September 2021, more than 104,000 Americans have died from a drug overdose, largely because of an illicit and poisoned drug supply that we cannot stop from coming into our country despite throwing billions of dollars into interdiction. Billions. And that's just the last couple of years. We are now over a trillion dollars spent on our current drug policy that is failing all of us as Americans. These deaths of our friends, my brother died from a drug overdose, our loved ones, and our policing professionals that aren't even included in that stat requires us to rethink our drug control strategies by embracing public health interventions that will result in saving lives. In other words, an effective drug control strategy will view the law and its exercise of power as proper only when we link public health and safety, not just when we enforce the law as an end to itself, which is what we tend to do right now. And I'm just going to end it with saying it's time to declare peace with drugs. Okay. Hector, how about yourself? I am the belief, because of my experience in combating drugs, that the legalization of drugs will be disastrous to this country. The making it commerce, making it legal, will only create a big drug industry. Drug industries are going to be created, and their whole focus is going to be on making money. Okay? So if we legalize them, what's going to prevent us? Who's going to control the manufacture of these drugs and how dangerous they are? Because... The bigger the addict population, the more these drug companies are going to make. These pharmaceutical companies are going to create synthetic and very dangerous drugs to what? To make the, the addict population bigger, to drive bigger profits, okay? The greatest mortality rate of drug abuse right now comes from legal drugs believe it or not, alcohol and tobacco. They are the biggest reasons, or the, they, they cause the biggest death right now of, of, uh, of overdoses or the, their abuse causes the, the, the biggest mortality rate in this country, okay? Legalization will result in these big pharmaceutical companies selling these drugs. Now, it's the DEA and the FDA's position that they should regulate and control the amount of drugs, and the potency of these drugs. And if we don't have the DEA and the FDA controlling the manufacture of these very dangerous drugs, our population is going to, any population is going to triple, the deaths are going to quadruple, and basically legalizing drugs is not going to solve anything because the Addicts, okay, and these drugs that they're using cause them to commit criminal acts. Crim and other crimes that they might not commit when they're sober under the influence of these very potent drugs that are going to be produced by these 
pharmaceutical companies will drive them to commit crimes. So that's not going to solve the, 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 the arrest and crime situation. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we're going to have more problems and we're going to have to put more people in prison than we're doing right now. Hector, which drugs concerns you the most? Very basically, uh, the opiates. Right now, we are in a in a uh, opiate epidemic. Okay. The mortality rate right now is higher than it's ever been, Patrick. We are losing seventy thousand people at an average a year of opiate overdoses, and these are not the cartels. These are our pharmaceutical companies. In in nineteen ninety nine, the DEA and the FDA relaxed their enforcement uh, control of these uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies. There was pressure by lobbyists that were for this uh, pharmaceutical companies to Congress. They basically caused the, 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 the DEA and the, and the, and the uh, Food and Drug Administration to lessen the, their enforcement. And therefore, since 1999 to the present, the relaxing of enforcement of, uh, of the production of these drugs has created the drug epidemic that we have now. We are now experiencing the worst drug epidemic in the history of, of, uh, of our country. More so than heroin abuse, more so than meth abuse, even more so than fentanyl. And as these drug companies are permitted, they will create very powerful and synthetic drugs, and they're going to push them and sell them to our addict population. So. Legalizing drugs, to me, is no answer. So, but, but let's, let's stay on that. So uh, let's get specific. So opioids are legal, though, right? So, I mean, uh, I, uh, you know, uh, some of them I can get legally from the doctors. Can, can, can I jump in for a sure. second? Because I think this is really important. Um, there's two things. I, I don't necessarily disagree with you about the commercialization of the potential for drugs and the commercialization. I mean, we've seen it a little bit already with cannabis, right? But. Here's the other issue that happened that, you know, I think is really critically important, is what is driving the illicit poison drug supply right now is not opioids. It's the introduction of illicit fentanyl that's coming in because we cut off China and then the Mexican cartels have sent it over. So that's what's causing the overdose death right now. It's polydrug overdose and it's the illicit fentanyl because people don't have a safe supply of drugs. People don't know what's out in the street. And I'm going to blame the DEA a little bit and some of the drug czars because I've written about this extensively. There was a point in time during the Obama administration where they started to crack down on alleged pill mill doctors and I'm not saying that those aren't out there. But what that caused, it was a huge market disruption that we need to understand very clearly. And what it took, it took legitimate pain patients out from getting safe supply prescribed drugs into the illicit market where they were now spending 60 bucks a pop for an Oxycontin pill who recognized, you know what, it's cheaper to get heroin. And so then they started using heroin and then the illicit market supply got poisoned with fentanyl. And so it is not opioids that are driving the overdose death. Yes, they contribute it, but that's not the case. Well, I tend to disagree with you there because most people that are hooked on opiates start by consuming drugs that are prescribed to them medically. What drives these people to the, the abuse of fentanyl, uh, methamphetamines, uh, all these other dangerous drugs, heroin, is a fact that they become addicted, the doctors cut them off, they don't prescribe these drugs for them anymore, and they run to the black market, to the cartels, to get their drugs because illegally. The, because they got cut off from a safe supply because the DEA started enforcing the law in a fashion that drove legitimate pain patients. I, the research, my master's degree is actually in drug policy. It's not, an, it's not a master's in business. All the empirical research in the last few years shows very clearly the, the link between how we constrict. Interdiction does not work because we constrict drug supply on one side and it just balloons in another area. 
what we do is we play a trillion dollar game of whack-a-mole with the drug supply and it's not working and if we start talking about fiscal issues and about how are we going to really impact and save people's lives we have to recognize the failures of our current policy it, we're not winning the war on drugs kiki and i'm tired of losing police officers including Kiki Camarina, because he got killed when I was a young police officer. I remember his death. I remember it. Is we need to stop sending our cops into areas where we know it's a failure. That, you know, that's, I think, the thing that really concerns me is this lack of, of reflection by our, by our government <coughs> guys that are willing to just throw the cops out there to solve societal problems that can't be solved there, you from know, criminalization. There was, uh, there was a lot there. So th yeah. there's a couple things I want to do. One on opioids, we're going to come back to it because uh, uh, the exception to the rule when you say a lot of people also weren't able to get access to oxytocin or Xanax or whatever, the pain medication that they needed, my best friend in the world died from Vicodin, and I took him to rehab for yep. 14 days because... The dentist was selling it to him and giving it to him because he was making money. So for every one story of somebody doesn't have access to, there's a hundred that are being abused by doctors. And many would agree with that. The numbers right there showed, if you can show the chart on opioids, uh, uh, right there on what it's looking like and what's happened the last few years. David, if we can go to it, this is how many opioid uh, uh, sure. deaths we used to have every year. Look at the spike from 2014. And you're talking during the Obama administration when the DA tried to crack it down to look where it's at right now. Uh, uh, with the numbers that we're having. I think even this last year we crossed over 100,000 deaths we that did. we're talking about. You saw that over uh, all over the place. But this is kind of where I want to go, Hector, with you. And then I want to go with you as well, just so the audience knows this. So number one, so uh, uh, drug uh, uh, legalizing or keeping it illegal, right? Which ones do you worry about the most? Because let's look at wheat. Let's look at ecstasy. Let's look at crack. Let's look at cocaine. Let's look at any of those things. Let's start off there first. Which of those four concerns you the most? Actually, all of them, because they're all very highly addictive. Uh, fentanyl bothers me a lot, because you could die on the first use of fentanyl. You don't have to be addicted, and, and a lot of our, our children are dying. You know, uh, they're all very dangerous, Patrick. These drugs are killer drugs. You can die from using these drugs, and they're so addictive that it's very, very hard to, get, to be rehabilitated and be cured. Uh, you know, I don't have a problem with with uh, people using drugs. I don't. I don't think that people that use drugs should be arrested. I think these That's people great. should be treated okay. and should we be agree. rehabilitated. Okay. Okay. And I'm a DEA agent. I think it's wrong for uh, for us to arrest the victims of these drug cartels. Any and, one and, of and, them. Any one any of drug, them. Cocaine, it's, heroin, anything. Exactly. I think that. Uh, users of drugs, whether it be heroin, cocaine, fentanyl, I don't care. I don't think the users should be incarcerated. They should. I don't think they should be punished. I think they should be cured. We should do okay. more on rehabilitating and curing our drug addicts. Okay. So, so if I if I'm at a restaurant and I'm at Denny's, I'm at Waffle House, I'm at Chili's. I say I'll have a uh, you know a cream broccoli soup. They bring it to me. I bring the chicken. And I say, uh, okay, thank you so much. And right there, I do a line of cocaine. You're okay with that? Because you're saying I'm just doing a line of cocaine. I'm not selling. Are you saying you're okay if I'm using that at a restaurant legally? I, th I, think, I, 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 I think you shouldn't be arrested. But let me answer that one. Because this is where I think you and I are kind of on the same side. Okay. So let's take a look at Portugal, right? Okay. Portugal drug policy right now. And I think here's the thing is we have to have a, this clear understanding. That, you know, there's... We in America don't understand what true decriminalization means. So in Portugal, they have decriminalized all drugs. Their public health agency has determined the amount of drugs that is perfectly legal for possession, right? You know, X amount of days for, you know, this type of drug, for this type of drug, whatever it happens to be. If you're in Portugal and you're, you know, get that line of cocaine, you're still going to have a law enforcement initial contact, but the decriminalization in Portugal doesn't require you going to jail. 
it's a civil process. They give you a ticket, they take your drugs, they send you to a dissuasion court, which is non-coercive. And you show up in this dissuasion court in order to determine whether maybe you have a substance use disorder or not. And if you don't, they send you on your way and say, here is your 50 euro fine. Now, one of the things that I think is really important, if you start looking at the empirical research and the science, like last year we arrested over 1.5 million people for some type of drug violation, right? About 83% of those folks are for simple possession only. And then let's take a look at the empirical research. The empirical research will tell you that 80 to 90% of the people who are using drugs do not suffer from a substance use disorder. So right now we are churning people into the criminal justice system who don't need to be there, that we could deal with public health interventions in other ways. So under your example, yeah, you're still going to have a law enforcement contact. Exactly. But. And do what? It, you're going to go to a dissuasion court. If we adopted true decriminalization okay. like Portugal exactly. does, exactly. And I agree with you would go to a dissuasion court where there's no criminal penalties. You, you don't. Simply pay a fine. You, you pay a fine or they encourage you. And, and we've seen this result mm -hmm. in Portugal, very conservative Catholic country. The reason they went to this is because their overdose rates was horrible. They've reduced their overdose death by 50%. They have um, uh, reduced AIDS and HIV because people aren't sharing needles. And there's more people going into treatment. And then you also have Switzerland that does heroin-assisted treatment program under a prescribed model. You have Canada right now. In 2020, the Canadian police chiefs came out with a report, a white paper, that basically says, in order for us to deal with our fentanyl illicit poison drug supply. I'm going to say that all the time because it's an illicit poison drug supply that is killing people right now, is that they recommend full decriminalization like Portugal, the introduction of safe supply, which is pharmaceutical grade for people who are suffering from opioid disorder, just like Switzerland does, and then expand interventions like overdose prevention centers, safe supply, um, safe injection sites. So here's some stats that you to validate your point. Then and now, Portugal's drug uh, decriminalization in 1999 they had 369 overdose. In 2016 was 30. In 2000 they had 907 HIV diagnosis through injection. Now it's 18. 99 people incarcerated was 3,863. Now 1140 and 17. So question: How different is Portugal than Oregon? Um, you know, we don't have enough stats yet for Oregon in order to quantify this. You know, it is obviously Oregon uh, past measure 110, and we'll see. Because I think that, you know, uh, as much as I'm a firm believer in sensibly regulating all drugs because I'd rather have the government in charge of potency and the FDA and those, and, and you know, officials, um, but full decriminalization like Oregon has done, is, I think, going to be the wave of the future because even last night in, in President Biden's um, speech, for the first time we mentioned harm reduction. And, and for the first time, I think that we're actually going to be investing in public health interventions almost at the rate that we now do for supply-side interdiction. Patrick, but Portugal legalized drugs. No, but they became realize. they became very very stringent with the uh, manufacturers of drugs. Correct. They really controlled them. In other words, they controlled the amount of drugs that these pharmaceutical companies were manufacturing and selling, and so they totally didn't legalize drugs because you're still controlling yeah. the manufacture, production, and sales of dangerous drugs, even though they did decriminalize. The use, as, as uh, the lady here has stated, but they didn't totally legalize it either. Well, and and that's the what is decriminalization, what is legalization, what's sensible regulation. There's a continuum on the spectrum, and I think you know finding that you know that that perfect fit. Um, I don't think you're ever going to see a heroin store at the corner of you know Fifth and Main in America. 
but you will have heroin assisted treatment programs that are much more efficacious so for example in switzerland i mean this is this is not anything new is this has occurred across the world in many aspects in switzerland heroin assisted treatment programs basically um, the empirical science directly reflected a drop in crime with from people who were in the program people got off welfare they reintegrated into their families their communities and so we know public health interventions long term are much more efficacious than using the hammer of the criminal justice system so let's just say so let's just so in your world you would want all the drugs to stay illegal is that what your world would be not necessarily only those drugs that kill people Okay, drugs that, that are oh, not so life-threatening, want... I think should be legalized. So marijuana should be legal. I'm not against it. Okay, so marijuana is legal because in the history only one person's died. Exactly. Right? 2019, when this 39-year-old died, and, you know, that's the uh, stat story that came out. I think it's a Newsweek story. THC overdose, the first death from marijuana exposure has been recorded in the United States. Uh, according to the New Orleans Advocate, uh, Coroner Christy uh, Montegid has outlined how he believes a 39-year-old woman discovered death in her uh, dead in her apartment died from vaping THC oil. Okay, so that's one. So ecstasy should it be legal or illegal? It should be illegal because ecstasy is a, is a dangerous drug. No, I'll disagree. Okay. Right now, empirical research has shown we are in third stages of clinical trial with MDMA, legal regulated MDMA through an organization called MAPS where it has now been shown that MDMA, because it used to be legal in the 1980s when psychotherapists were using before kids figured out how to make it on their own. And so we are in an FDA-approved third clinical trial of the use of MDMA and psychedelics to treat PTSD, to treat, um, you know, end-of-life end cancer. I mean, it's really amazing. And so... I think here's the issue, is every drug can be abused. Let's recognize that. And there's going to be different regulatory fashions. Marijuana is going to be treated different than MDMA, who will probably be FDA and available for, you know, use by therapists. And then you're going to have heroin-assisted treatment that may be prescribed by medical providers. So we have to look at the full continuum. But the whole scheduling of, of drug issue is just a manufacturing of danger that isn't necessarily the case. Marijuana is on Schedule 1, for goodness sake. Here's the problem. The problem with, with stating that ecstasy should be legalized, marijuana should be legalized, the problem is when you make it legal, these, these drug companies are going to make it more potent, Patrick. The marijuana that is being smoked now is not the marijuana that was smoked in the 60s and 80s by the hippies. The marijuana that was being smoked 60 years ago by our hippies was 2% uh, THC content. The marijuana now that is being produced legally is 30% and above THC content. The same thing with ecstasy. Once these pharmaceutical companies get a hold of this and it's legal, they are going to make synthetic uh, ecstasy, and they're going to make ecstasy more dangerous and powerful. So, to say, let's legalize marijuana, let's legalize ecstasy because they don't kill people, but once these greedy, money-driven uh, companies get a hold of this stuff, they're going to make it so potent, and they're going to try to make it addictive to drive the prices up. That is the problem, Patrick, is the fact that, like I state, stated before, the marijuana that, that the hippies were smoking in 1960 is not the marijuana that is being sold now. The marijuana in the 1970s that I smoked a lot in high school, again, I was like the surprising, you know, be the police officer, Maui Wowie, which is basically was kind of what you're getting out of Humboldt now. Tie sticks that were imported that had that really super cool little red line that that's why they called them tie sticks you know great weed that was coming out of other places yes they, I, and this is why we want regulation 
because we, we should be able to cap THC levels. And I think that's on governments that as... So then, excuse me, so then you agree that they shouldn't be totally legalized? Well, no, because but, once you regulate it, you're not making it totally legal. Well, no, but, but I, I don't think it should be. I'm not for anarchy. See, and again, I think this is the issue of, of let's define what legalization means. Let's, let's say sensible regulation is a form of legalization because it allows adults to access things like cannabis, right? It would allow adults to access, you know, if, if you are suffering from cancer or from PTSD, that you can go to a psychotherapist who can do a life-saving, you know, therapeutic treatment that's not available right now. I know vets whose lives, you know, been in Afghanistan, blown up, suffering from terrific PTSD, who have gone to other countries to do ayahuasca or other treatments and have come back, not necessarily 100% cured, but able to sustain a really good life. So then a question for you. So you think the individual should have the choice to have access to weed, ecstasy, cocaine, crack, uh, all these drugs, heroin? So not a free-for-all. If you are suffering from uh, a substance use disorder because you're addicted to heroin, there are modalities out there that you should be able to access, which includes a safe supply of drugs, heroin-assistant treatment, therapeutics. So it depends on the drug. You know, our organization doesn't believe in anarchy, but we understand that the harms of criminalization is what's fueling the illicit market, the so, violence. So, so, okay, so you're not saying legalizing all the drugs. That's not what you're I'm saying. I'm saying sensibly regulating, which is just another term for maybe legalizing, but it shouldn't be, you know, anarchy. There's... If I, you keep saying anarchy. What do you mean by like that? Like, you can just walk in and buy, you know, methamphetamine wherever you so want what, it. So should, should the way I buy methamphetamine is the same way I buy it based on a, do, a doctor prescribing it to me? It, where it, I can't it, just go to CVS and buy it off Adderall? the counter? I mean, isn't that what Adderall so, is? So, so your suggestion is to make it sensibly, <clears throat> uh, not legal, what's the word you're sensibly using? Sensibly regulated. Sensibly, sensibly regulated is the same way I am prescribed Vicodin. It could be. It depends on the process. It depends on the drug. It but depends you're not saying I go to the mall and I just buy it. Correct. Okay, fair. Okay, so that's but, what you're... But, but cannabis, you can cannabis as, is, as an adult. Yeah. You know, it... So, you know what it makes me think about, though, and this goes kind of to you because of a point he made. So, so why is it that we're... The death toll for legalized drugs is higher than illegal drugs. Let me unpack this, That's and I want to ask you, because he just made a good point, and I was actually going to push it on you, but then you flipped it, and I'm going to sure. put it on her. So opioids, okay? I mean, nowadays, you want it, you get it, people are dying, it's going higher and higher. Now they're giving it to kids. Kids are starting to take it now. I mean, I, I, I have four kids. Exactly. Yeah. Kids are not going through this. I lived in a city called Plano. The story Plano, of Plano, Texas. what it used to be, is a whole story of... What happened there with these kids that were being handed drugs out and the next thing you know? Anyways, that's a completely different story. But opioids is at 100,000. Cigarettes. You know how many people died last year from cigarettes? 480. 480,000 exactly. people died from cigarettes yesterday. That's one in five. Everybody, one in five deaths last year was tied to cigarettes. That's the number right there. More than 480,000 deaths annually from smoking and secondhand smoke. Okay. I mean, when you hear a statistic like that, Philip Morris, legal. You know, Vicodin, uh, Xanax, all this stuff, legal. So where I would say we need to make Vicodin illegal, we need to make some of these things tougher to get a hold of. Doc, many of these guys that are drug dealers going to jail, some of these doctors should be going to jail for Thank the work you. that they're doing. Thank so you. this flips it that if we made it more easier to get accessible, folks who are in sales... They're going and dropping uh, uh, packets off to the doctors, and nowadays they can bribe the doctors. Hey, I'll give you $10,000 speaking fee, $20,000 speaking fee if you start prescribing this stuff. That's an additional income to the doctor. The doctor's trying to make money to have his S500 parked outside. Next thing you know, these pharmaceutical companies are doing advertisement on national telev 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 televised uh, networks. Oh, my God. You know, and by the way, then a risk. This could cause death. This could cause this. But you should use it. And they keep a nice, pretty face that's using it. So... 
That could also, that's also a good point that if we do that, the marketers are going to go out there and figure out a way to profit off of these things. So we're only one of two countries that allows prescript uh, pharmacies to advertise on television. I, You're against it. I'm totally against okay. pharmacists or pharma pharmacy companies and corporate. But let's let's go back to this. Right now in the United States. I'm sorry, you said one of two countries? One of two countries. What's I the can't other one? I can't remember. Can you pull up to see who the but, other two But I think that we're, we're one of two countries that that allow advertising. I don't think cannabis should be advertised on TV. I don't think tobacco should. Or alcohol even. Right? New Zealand. There we go. Okay, so we're the only two countries, and I think that's part of the issue, okay. is Americans, you know, tend to think that popping a pill is going to solve everything. But I also don't think that making things illegal stops people from trying something. You know what does? Public health interventions and education does. Look at what we've done with teen smoking is down. Like, I just pulled, and, and, and I'd have to go back and take a look at them, is the stats for drug use amongst teenagers. Like, the kids are all right. The sky isn't falling. They're not having sex. They're not smoking weed as much. They're not drinking. They're not smoking cigarettes. They're not using other drugs. I think we need to stop looking at... Is that at, because of you guys or because of no, smartphone and all no, the distractions? It, it, who knows? Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a bunch. It's, you know, we don't have kids getting pregnant as much as they used to because we taught them. You think Through that's what it is? Or you I think, think because I, of social media and distractions? I, I think there's a lot of different things, but I think that, that harm reduction, you know, let's talk about those words, is really giving people the skills to critically analyze what they're putting in their bodies, whether it's a prescription. Look, I've had multiple surgeries. I've had two broken ankle surgeries. I've had two knee surgeries. I've, you know, have eight bulging discs in my neck and my back. I have used plenty of opioids. And, and I've had plenty of surgeries. I've had Oxycontin. I'm really not the average, or I'm more than the average person. Is it's unusual for people to get addicted to opioids based on surgery. Yes, it occurs, you know, but it's not as prevalent. And so, you know, we look at, you know, the fentanyl deaths. I'm going to go back. It's not pharmacy fentanyl that's killing people right now. It's Mexican cartel illicit fentanyl that's coming in from across our border. We, and, can, we can talk about fentanyl, excuse me, but... The biggest mortality rate is caused by opiates, not fentanyl. Yes, it's a combination. And what drives people to fentanyl is the fact that they become already addicted. And once they become addicted and they can't get the drugs easily, that's when they run to the cartels. Who provides them with fentanyl, meth, heroin, and what have you? So we have to look at statistics and reality here. The highest mortality rate of overdoses is not caused by fentanyl, sweetheart. It's, it's caused by opioids right now. We have a, we're experiencing an opioid, an opioid epidemic. We're losing over 70,000 Americans every year to opiate overdoses. It's a combination. It's, it's the poison drug supply by illicit fentanyl because the press pills, a significant number of all the seizures that are that are happening across the country show that illicit fentanyl and that people don't know what they're buying. It's not, people are not taking an, a, a prescribed Oxycontin that they've gotten, you know, in the street that's a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical grade pill. They're not dying from that. Some people do, but the majority is from a polydrug overdose death lot of it with illicit fentanyl. You know what I'm curious? Uh, uh, here's what I'm curious if you want to pull it up. I'm curious to know, you know, in law, we know a lot of lawyers mm -hmm. who lost their law uh, uh, ability to practice law. Yeah, happens right. all the time, right? A lot of lawyers who have lost it. How many doctors have lost their license due to uh, over, don't, not, uh, what's, what word would it be? Over prescribing. Over prescribing opioids. Are you guys familiar with that? Do you hear? Is there stats yes. that you know about that? Well, the problem it's hard because every state's different too. So I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll, no, I'll I'm just saying is every state's different. So you know, I don't have the stats. Click on that uh, link yeah. at the top. But even though every state is different, the DEA 
federally regulates the registration of drugs Correct. to prescribe, um, you know, these, 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 these drugs. So it's, it's, it's not, I believe, a state situation. It's a federal situation where the DEA should be, as Petra suggested, going after some of these doctors more aggressively. So here's a story. For, if you can, uh, uh, this is justice.gov. Former Albany physicians pays $125,000 for over-prescribing opioids. Dr. James J. Cole's patients were prescribed high-level opioids and the uh, Holy Trinity cocktail. Uh, okay, here we go. So over some opioids and controlled substances to patients, including one patient who died. Cole also forfeited his prescribing privileges mm -hmm. and his medical license. I think, I think this is actually good where DEA is getting involved here. And DEA registrants hold a whole great responsibility and trust that Keith Kruskal, acting special agent in charge of the DA New York Division, this particular registrant, violent that trust in the settlement in place of demonstrates how DA and our law enforcement partners will continue to hold all resources, all sources of diversion accountable. Okay, so what is what is um, so let's let's go your route. Let's make everything illegal. Okay? okay, so I'm gonna give you the flip side of the argument to you and see how you're gonna answer this. Okay, I'm interviewing Sammy de Bulgravano. Okay, you know who he is. I know who he sweetheart, is. Sweetheart, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm interviewing Sammy Dubul Gravano, which you know what he's done. He's killed 19 people, went to jail, John Gotti's right-hand guy, the underboss, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Okay. And I talked to him about guns. He says, a person like me wants you to legalize guns, wants you to make guns illegal. He says, you know why I want you to make it illegal? I said, why? He says, because the average person can't get it, but I'm always going to get access to guns. Mm -hmm. So I support you banning guns. Think about the argument Sammy is taking. He wants guns to be illegal because he's still going to get it. He says the bad guy's going to find a way to get the guns, right? Okay, so let me flip it on you with drugs. So let's just say we ban all drugs, okay? So the question then becomes access. Does that mean the guy in the inner city that's selling crack and mixing it or cocaine or X or whatever you want to call it, you don't think he's going to get access to sell it? You think the access is going to get harder for him? Right. I want to make the same. I'm going to, I'm going to the same kind of um, analogy back to you. Sure. You think drug traffickers like El Mayo Zambada, um, El Mencho, um, El Chapo Guzman, do you think they want the U.S. to make legal uh, legalized drugs? Of course not. They want the drugs to stay illegal. That's correct. Because they don't have to compete against the, the drug manufacturing companies. They want it to stay illegal because they're the only source now of drugs. I'm giving you the same analogy. Of course, El Chapo Guzman doesn't want the, D, uh, the U.S. to legalize drugs. Of course, my old son brother doesn't either. Because as long as they're illegal, their profits go sky high. So let's talk about, you just made my case, pretty much. Both of you guys have just made my case, is that who do we want control of the most dangerous substances? We've abdicated control. What you've described is exactly the anarchy we have right now, is the people who control drugs in the United States is not the government. We just play reactive ball to whatever the cartels are doing. And so we know, you know, I've heard this, and this has been the standard mantra you know, we're arresting all these low-level drug dealers because we're working our way up to the kingpin, but we get the kingpin, and all we do is we fragment the market. And now there's a fight for that market share, and then you see the uptick in violence. So why are we allowing the worst actors who don't care about community health and safety to control that really dangerous market? I don't think it's going to make a difference. Let me explain uh, why. So let's say you legalize it, okay? What does what do politicians in the White House love doing? Their favorite day of the year is April fifteenth. Sure, they taxes. love increasing taxes. Okay? Exactly. So what happens if they increase taxes? So the same weed I could buy uh, that's legal from Walmart or CVS is always going to be fifty percent higher, forty percent higher than me being able to sell it illegally. So even if you legalize it, the drug dealer is going to still have the edge to sell at half the price that the government's selling because taxes are going to be we increased. We still have moonshine. So let's just put this myth to bed that we are ever going to eliminate 
crime completely or drugs completely in our society. We're never even going to eliminate the mafia completely. We did a really good job once alcohol prohibition ended. And then what we have to do is where I do agree with Kiki is let's do strategic policing and take out those actors that are causing the most harm in our society, right? But from a liberty perspective, as Americans, we are never going to be a a crime-free society. We're never going to be a drug-free society. We're always going to have to deal with these issues. And so we have to look at policy in the, in the sense of how do we mitigate the most harms without turning into a state where we're killing people in no-knock warrants over drugs or police officers are losing their lives. So, so did you have a response to her or what I said about taxes? Uh, no, I, I agree with you totally that it's going to be taxed. It's mm-hmm. going to be expensive to buy the drugs. And the cartels are going to make them available at a cheaper rate. That's what's going to happen. You're going to have the cartels basically competing with the uh, the government that's going to tax them. Yeah, because, I, I mean, you know, look, uh, uh, that's the drug dealer's model. He's going to be like, look, I, how much are they charging at CVS? How much is that at Walgreens? No problem. I'll give it to you for half the price because I'm getting volume and I'm bringing it for South or Central America. But, but let me go to a different place. Can you pull up uh, uh, de- cigarette death uh, stats by year? Just type in cigarette death stats by year. I'm actually curious to know what it looked like in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and where we are today. Because this is leading to a question based on what you said. See if you can pull up stats. Uh, I want to know by year. I was uh, talking about kids, remember. Yes. No, I do. I do know. And I, we pulled that up as well when we were talking. Okay, so... No, do you have it by year? Okay, I want to know by year, look how hard they make it to find a stat like this. How hard should it be for me to find out how many people died every year by cigarettes? Because here's, here's where I'm going with this. Go back, to, go back to the last page you were. So when's the last time, uh, Hector or Diane, when's the last time we saw a cigarette commercial? Uh, actually, it's been since, uh, I believe, the 70s when we had the uh, Marlboro Man. Remember the Marlboro Man? Yeah. Oh, the Marlboro Man. Mm-hmm. And the, 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 it was the, um, what's it, the Camel with, with camel. the Camel cigarettes? Camel. Uh, camel. That must yeah. have been in the 70s that we last okay. had the commercial. So watch but, this. So but then, they used to push those commercials heavy on us. I know they did. But here's the thing. Even with the stoppage of the commercials from these f- cigarette companies, 480,000 people still died last year. That's right. So, That's so, so for me, is while we're trying to focus so much time on weed, you know, coke, fent, all this stuff, and by the way, opioids is spiking, so we have to pay very close yeah, attention do. to yes, that. We do. Because it's, it's, it's too much of an explosive uh, uh, uptick that they have. You know, stopping ads from cigarettes didn't stop. What makes us think stopping ads from pharmaceutical companies is going to work? You know, in these opioid companies, that's going to work because it def- definitely didn't work for cigarettes. People are still dying. 480 died last year. Because we as humans always are going to try to alter our minds in some aspects. We've had, we've smoked tobacco for hundreds of years. We've, we've done psychedelic drugs. If you go back and look at indigenous populations, is they found marijuana in China. Is we are never going to have the perfect, healthy human being who is not going to want to alter themselves in some fashion. You know, coffee gives me my pump in the morning. Sometimes I have a glass of wine in the evening to calm down. And so, again, I start looking at public health interventions. And what you're talking about is a very small percentage of our society. And I'm not saying we write people off, but in 1914, when the Harrison Tax Act was first filed and um, opioids became illegal in the United States. There was a study that reflected that 1% of the U.S. population at that time suffered from some type of substance use disorder relative to opioids. Do you want to know what the percentage today still is? It's about 1% of the population. So it's again about our fiscal resources. You know, Rand in 1996, Kiki will remember this report, Rand, Rand Corporation, not known for its liberal tendencies, did a report that they basically uh, analyzed marijuana and cocaine and what treatment modality would work better, supply-side interventions or 
treatment, like public health treatment, drug treatment. And what Rand found out in 1996, that for every dollar invested in treatment, it returned seven times the dollar back to the taxpayer. So the taxpayer... Every time the one was arrested, seven dollars, no, for every dollar? So every time that someone entered treatment, for every dollar spent on drug treatment, for cocaine or marijuana back then, is the the taxpayer saves seven dollars for each of those dollars invested, and so we know that public health interventions are smarter sense from a fiscal perspective, make more sense than um, criminalizing people. So you left California recently. So California, do you know what the price it is to incarcerate? a prisoner in California prisons right now per year. Can you even guess? $55,000. $100,000. $108,000, I think, almost to be exact, okay. for one prisoner in a California prison per year. Over six figures. If we took that money and used that money as early intervention money, we would be much better off than throwing someone in jail. So we, no. we in American justice, we throw people away. And that's why I do the work that I'm doing. My brother died from a polydrug overdose. He was criminalized because he had mental health issues and he was bipolar. And I saw the complete and abject failure of our system, both personally and professionally. Every time we'd go out and do an undercover buy and arrest someone, There'd be 100 more people that were using drugs. Every time we arrested a dealer, there'd be 10 more dealers. It's, there, there has to come a point where we address the issues, both from a fiscal perspective and from an empirical science. What is best to mitigate the harms of, of horrible criminal justice interventions that, you know, the, the collateral consequence of a, of, of a criminal conviction will destroy people's lives. And then just throw them back into the criminal justice system because it makes them a better crook. Well, uh, uh, to your point, uh, uh, is it called Wackenhurt? I don't know if you call it uh, Wackenhurt. Wackenhurt. Uh, now Hunt, uh, now Correction, Geo Group. Geo group. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a, a REIT. There's a, they're a real, uh, real estate investment trust where they are funded by taxpayers, people like you and I, mm -hmm where they build uh, prisons, and this is uh, a free, you know, they, they build prisons, but it's private prisons that they build. They do it in U.S., South Africa, U.K., and one other place, I believe they do. Uh, uh, Australia is where they build it. Yep. These four places that they build. It's a multi, multi-billion auto conglomerate at this point. They just keep building prisons because it's a business model that they have, right? So Correct. there is also a group that wants this thing to continue because it's a very profitable, and I think Newsom... And Trump, that is one area that they're on the same page with. Trump was also against it, where they, they wanted to look at it, as well as Newsom said he's stopping funding to GEO, I believe, as of two years ago. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the private prison industry is a blip on the government prison industry. It, it, it's absolutely worth not having and making certain people don't profit off, off the criminal justice system in that fashion, because from the private prison industry, which is really interesting, is they negotiate contracts that's based on a capitated rate that you're going to pay for every bed, whether it's filled or not. So, of course, you know, it, it's, it's going to make money. And, and their professionalism for staff, I mean, you've got private prison groups in, in Arizona in particular that have basically the, the medical treatment of mm -hmm. prisoners has Mental, been Mental, yeah, they got different horrific. things set up. Yeah. Just yes. horrific. We've tried it here, yes. Yeah, so... So what is, so what is the solution? So, let's, so let's, let's talk both for, for solutions. So at this point of the game, uh, we know cigarettes kills the most. Then you got opioids, then you're dealing with uh, uh, cocaine. We pulled up ecstasy. By the way, 82 people died last year from ecstasy. That's right. the number. That's nothing. Right. That number's... Obviously, right. those families are not happy... Each of those deaths is a Correct. lot to the family that lost it, but comparable to the other stat, it is not a big number. Cocaine is 19,447 last year, and it's climbing. If you look at that number, right. it's not slowing down, it's climbing. Uh, so what is the solution? What, what is the right approach to this? Hector, I'll go to you first. I think the right approach is to decriminalize possession of drugs. Don't arrest the victim. We should decriminalize it. However, we should put stronger controls on drug manufacturer, 
stronger controls so that they will not inundate us with legal drugs, so that they will not make these drugs more potent and more dangerous, which they have, to put three controls and also to more aggressively investigate and enforce laws on these physicians that are prescribing these drugs. I believe that a strong enforcement of regulating of these um, companies that produce drugs, basically controlling very strongly, also enforce the laws against these pharmaceuticals that are making these drugs more potent, enforce laws against these doctors that are prescribing these, these, these drugs, and please stop punishing the victims. Stop punishing the drug users. Why are we filling our jails with the victims of the cartels? Another solution would be is to maybe be stronger in enforcing laws against international drug terrorists. I believe that when we arrest or capture these drug cartel overlords that are inundating our country with very dangerous drugs, I think the penalty should be stiffer than what they are right now. I think we should seek them out, find where they're at, extradite them to the United States, and be very, very strict on them. Close okay. to the death penalty. Close to the death penalty. Yes, sir. Okay. Diane? Couple things. The current Global illicit market trade has been pegged at $360 billion. It's $360 billion that's fueling death, disease, addiction, and violence, not just in the United States, but across the world. And though I do agree with many of the things that you said, um, Hector, and, and especially the part about someone who possesses drugs, whether they have a use disorder or not, should never set foot in a jail in the United States of America, ever. And I think as we work towards the future of policing is we need to be more strategic and then down the road we need to really look at outcomes and, and empirical research and evidence. And I'm just going to always go back to it as we know that Criminalizing people who use drugs doesn't stop them from abusing drugs. Every country that has abolished penalties or lessened penalties has not seen an increase in either crime or substance use disorder. And so I think that there's a smart way of doing this. If we start at a minimum with decriminalization and then we assess how to better regulate and who's going to regulate the drugs. And so I, you know, I, I don't want to see commercialization of, of drugs as Hector has talked about. I think that's really important, and, and I think our government needs to, our public health, the FDA, Health and Human Resources, SAMHSA needs to be the people that are determining what that policy looks like from, from a public health perspective, and not law enforcement. We've done a terrible job relative to the drug war. It's been a total and abject failure. Ha, has your position always been the same, or did it change when you went in from the mid-80s, 1980, 83, 4, to the point where you retired in 04? You know what? My, my, I always, well, first of all, I got hired despite my extensive, you know, marijuana use as a, as a kid. Like, I stopped in, at the end of high school, and then, you know, three years later, I got hired as a cop. And, um, you know, it did change over the years, and I think where it finally changed was when I was a sergeant running a, a seven-man multi-agency uh, task force drug surveillance team where we were doing meth labs and doing undercover buys where I saw just, like, the complete futility of what we were doing. Every time, you know, when we would arrest a real bad guy, I'm not talking about a narcotics dealer who's potentially a real bad guy, but, you know, like someone who was committing burglaries or someone who was committing robberies, because we did both career criminal and, and narcotics work, you saw a drop in crime in a, in a community. When we arrest drug dealers or people who possess or use drugs, it, it doesn't 
stop anything. And so I want us to use our, our limited fiscal resources to go after people who are shooting people, violent drug not offenders. Not drug dealers? If they're shooting someone, they need to be arrested. No, if they're not shooting someone, they're just selling. You know what? It depends. Low-level sustenance drug dealers, you know, my brother was one of those. As he sold low levels of drugs because that's how he got his heroin, you know, at the end of his life. It, it's, you know, I my story is super complicated because I've seen both kind of the personal and the professional side, and ultimately my brother died of an overdose. And, and When was that? What year was 2007. that? 2007. In did New that, Orleans. Did that change any feelings, opinions, or was it already the same before 07? I, I think it was the same before 07 because I saw the futility. So m my brother, for example, had been a person in recovery for 20 years, like in in his early 20s when I was a young police officer he had some criminal justice issues is the best way of describing it and then he became he he got his act together and he moved out of LA County and into Orange County and he was in recovery for 20 years and then he lost his job he lost access to his psychotropic meds he lost access to you know his health care and he went back to self-medicating and so I saw the criminal justice system from a real distinct perspective because he got arrested for like, God, one-tenth of a gram of methamphetamine, and I walked into to court with him. It was very striking, and, and, and Hector will know what Orange County demographics looks like. So Santa Ana Court, and although I'm Mexican, my brother and I both look white, and I walked in, recently retired lieutenant, and um, had 20 letters of recommendation for my brother, um, had a uh, drug rehabilitation place set up for him. He volunteered at homeless shelters and he sponsored people. I mean, he 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 had his troubles, but he was a he was a good guy. And I walk in with this great package, walk up to the DA and say, I don't want anything except for what my brothers do, which is deferred entry of judgment for this. And she popped open a um, case file, goes back to a twenty year old conviction 20 over 20 years and says no I'm sending your brother to state prison for 18 months to three years and my I remember this distinctly because this was like an epiphany and I turned around and I looked and every face in that courtroom but the judge the DA the bailiff and my brother and I although we were Mexican were all people of color black and brown people and the difference between my brother and everyone else in that courtroom was I could afford to hire my brother an attorney because I knew how the system worked. And when I was working gangs, I remember this one family that I worked with for a long time, helped dad get a job, got the mom in parenting classes, did the kids, got them out of the gang. I always remember this, this one moment when Julia said to me, you know, Officer Goldstein, you don't understand what it's like to be without resources. And I got it that day. And then my brother died three years later, and I started doing the advocacy work that I did. He got out? Did he get out when he died, or he died? No, in... no. My, my brother did not go to prison. He didn't I, do the 18 to 36. I months. hired an attorney. Okay. And got it. Because I knew exactly what he was entitled to. And I told the DA, he, he won't need a public defender. We're just going to ask for an extension yeah. because I'm going to go get an attorney. And he got deferred entry of judgment, and he went to drug court. But then he failed drug court because drug court, we rely on this abstinence-only model that is not evidence-based either, right? So, but that's kind of in the nutshell. That's what changed. You know, I saw both the professional and the personal. I've had police officer friends who've been killed. You know, it's, it's, you know, it, it's a real hard position to be in when we, we talk about how we dissent and how we talk about policy. But we do agree more than we disagree, don't we? Yes, we agree on a lot of points. I, I will tell you that. Right. I, I, I don't know if I'm the audience. I still know what you're suggesting is the solution moving forward. I, I, I think what we're suggesting is that we need to start by simply decriminalizing like Portugal does. We need to sensibly regulate certain drugs like we're doing with cannabis. We need to allow harm reduction interventions like um, 
safe injection f facilities that get people into like treatment. Like what New York is doing? Like what New York is doing, saving lots of lives. California, we're working on a bill. We need to have access to syringe exchange programs, to fentanyl uh, testing strips. We need um, to look at heroin-assisted <laughs> treatment. There's, and it, It's not an either-or. That's the yeah. issue. This is not an either-or question, and people... Oh, we try to peg drug policy. Let You're me, either legalized yeah. or you don't. It's so, not. So I, 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 uh, uh, I uh, have uh, uh, certain areas on, on the left that they have good arguments, the right that ask the right questions, mm -hmm. and then in the middle, right? So one of the things the right will say is, if your policies are so good, why is all the left-leaning cities and states that are ran by liberals have the highest homelessness, highest drug addicts, and the highest crime. Actually, that's, Why? that's been debunked. Go look it up. Go Google it. Which, which, which cities? Like uh, Baltimore is no, ran by no, San Francisco, them, yeah, but the, but there's, L.A., but there's other, Austin, there are other, is Chicago. There are well, other no, give cities. Thanks, though. Give cities. There, I, I swear I just saw this. Is There are other cities in conservative areas that, are, no way that's that are having the same type of issue. Yeah, this well, is not a liberal no, versus... No, but this is an article that's written by CNN and MSNBC and a Fox. It's not like it's a... Uh, uh, go, I'd have, little Lord. I'd, I'd, ha I'd have to find the article and look at it. Yeah, but if you say something like that, you say it. You have to back it up with well, where we can get but it. But I know, but I know, I've read it because this was reason, this a post by a friend no, or was this a credible no, this source? Was, no, this was a credible source. There was actually some statistics that basically kind of debunked that it's only liberal cities with liberal mayors with liberal policies that are having this issue. I think things are but much more complex. Just look at complex. San Francisco. Go look at San Francisco. Go look at New York. Go look at L.A. Go look at Chicago. Uh, Chicago we can is talk about the housing. highest. No, I'm specifically talking to you about. I'm talking to you about crime, homelessness, and drugs. Why is it that? Uh, because when Again, I listen housing, to housing, homelessness, because because I listen to your policies, yeah. and the average person can sit there and say, "Wow, heartfelt. I totally relate." Which one of us hasn't lost somebody to drugs, or hasn't had somebody that maybe gone to jail that was? You know, the criminal, just, criminal justice system didn't give them. I don't. I come from a father who was a 99 cent store guy. My sure. mom went back to Iran. I joined the army. I'm a broke kid. I didn't have yeah. any money. So I'm around that all the time as an Armenian. You ran into a lot of oh, Armenians yeah. in Glendale. So you know what Armenians known for, but uh, uh, what some of them have a reputation for. But when you look at some of these cities, what, why these policies Omaha, that sound Omaha. so... Omaha. Why these policies that sound so you know, sweet and gentle and kind, why does it produce the most unsafest cities in America? I don't, you know, because crime is incredibly complex, and um, I think part of the issue is, for years, is our legislators have basically not invested in preventative programs that are more efficacious in stopping crime than law enforcement. We wait until crime is out of control, and then we want the cops to solve it. So let's talk about mental health issues. We don't have enough resources in mental health, behavioral health, for people that can't afford it. Do you know what the average cost of a drug rehabilitation is? Thirty, forty thousand 40000 a month in a good one. Most people can't afford that. Our health care um, system is not set up to support and uplift people who are in I drug had treatment. I the batteries, by the way, so if I'm on my phone, I'm yeah. on search and stuff. Yeah, so, you know, I think it's a combination. You know, it, it's, it's jobs, it's housing, it's all sorts of different things. And I'm not saying that people who are homeless, who commit crimes, should not be held accountable. If you hurt someone, you should go to jail. If you steal from someone, you should be held accountable. But we should also be looking at the criminal justice system that if you break into someone's car because you need money to go buy illicit heroin, then as part of that accountability, we should expand treatment courts because right now we don't. Right now we cherry pick drug courts and we only allow the people in there who are going to be the most successful. You know, again, going back to it, uh, 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 you need to know my mother uh, grew up to a communist and her dad's an imperialist. Mm -hmm. 
This is why I said my whole life has been a story of debates. Dichotomy. Yeah, that's the point. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's why I love it. I think we yeah. need more of that. And I, by the way, uh, I respect you guys tremendously that are willing to have this conversation because, again, the audience is winning. But if you, if you look at numbers, if you just go out and look at crime rates, and then you go to those cities and states, okay, so California, highest taxes in America. You got all this tax money you're getting from all these billionaires. Why don't you, with all the liberal policies, you had decades to fix it. Correct. How come you haven't? It's How the legislator's fault. Okay, so then you I go to New York. You. Hey, New York, you've had liberal governors. You've, you've controlled the state. Liberal policy. You have this one of the top five highest taxes in America. You have the billions of dollars, and people are leaving your state because they're not feeling safe. Why don't you do something about it? You got Illinois. You, you got all these top businesses. You top five state in America with Fortune 500 companies. You're in the top five of the most headquarters in Illinois. How do you not fix these issues with all these taxes? So, so then the, 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 the speculation with the average voter is going to come out and Correct. say, as much as you say let's hire more people and the government to be in charge of this, I don't trust how the government uses money. They've been wasting my dollars for a long time. I'm sorry, Diane. You sound sweet. Good argument. I just don't trust where my money is going to go. You know, I don't disagree with yeah. you some in some ways because I'm kind of like a, you know, social, I'm a fiscal conservative and I'm a social libertarian. And I, 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 I can't disagree with you in a lot of what you say relative to that issue is I think that, you know, I have a love-hate relationship with government also because of some of those failings. But, but I think we have to dig back and we have to, as constituents as taxpayers we have to demand more from our politicians and from a public safety like a community health and safety perspective we've long abdicated um, input into the criminal justice system to the you know the so-called policing professionals and the policing professionals also have real entrenched interests you know there's the same type of profit interest in policing that there is in geo private for-profit prisons. In what way? Civil asset forfeiture reform. You know, why is it that we in government right now can take your money without a criminal conviction just because we have a, a, a dope dog that walks up and, and alerts on it? And there's, so there's, there's that. I mean, you look at, you know, there was a, a, a city in Alabama that recently, there was this big article, I think it was in the Washington Post, where they were, uh, towing people's cars and fining people to such an excess that it, it finally became this issue. So there was this policing for profit issue. You know, we have to take profit out both from commercialization of drugs, but also from government. We shouldn't be profiting off of taxpayers. Who shouldn't be profiting off of taxpayers? So, so then the question comes to accountability. Yep. So how you hold uh, people we give our tax money to accountable. By the way, case study, which state would you say is doing it right? If you were to say this state is doing it right, you know, and for, for example, just a year and a half ago, yeah. I'm in Texas because I moved from uh, L.A. 20-some years, minus the time I was in the Army, to Texas. Mm -hmm. I put my headquarters in Texas for one reason. It's three hours from anywhere, and I was traveling six Correct. months out of the year, so it was an easy airport to go to Love or Fort Worth. It was fantastic. Taxes was low, low regulation, felt good about the schooling for my kids, so I felt comfortable. A year and a half ago, my wife and I are talking about moving back to Newport. We want to go back to, not back to Newport, I've never lived in Newport, but we want to go to Newport. I always like the city, I like mm -hmm. the restaurants, I like the schooling, let's go to Newport. So we go to L.A. and we see the homelessness. My dad lived in Granada Hills, I said, Dad, we never had homeless yeah. people here when I lived here. Spike. So then we're thinking about moving to Greenwich, going to New York. So we go to New York, we go to Greenwich. What the hell is going on here? Yeah, exactly. So then we looked at Nashville, Tennessee, okay, because I used to live in Nashville when I was in the Army, Correct. Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And then we looked at Tampa, and then we looked at Fort Lauderdale. We used to come here every summer to take our kids, and we had a good time. So I said, let's come down here. We came here because we saw the least amount of homelessness, safer, good for business, mm -hmm. lifestyle. So it's as if, if California and Texas had a baby, it would be Florida. Florida. That's what it would be. But to, to, we have yeah. to look at who's doing it right and kind of use that as a case study. Who would you say that is? I, you know, when you, when you start talking about just drug policy, it's not Florida. <laughs> um, Oregon, you know, I'm waiting to see the assessment of Oregon. 
California is really screwed up the cannabis regulation. We're treating it like plutonium and we're overtaxing it. That's my libertarian tendencies mm -hmm. coming out, and that's mm -hmm. propping up the illicit market. Um, you know, so it's complicated. And, you know, I live in Nevada now, although my policing career and I grew up in California, and it's funny you mentioned as I'm looking to move out of Nevada because I need water and ocean, and I'm looking at Florida or like Nashville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And so I don't think there's any state that's perfect around any one particular issue. It's, it's just, it's different. Yeah, because the, the, the way we're going, is it fair to say that America lost the war on uh, drugs? Oh, yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree with that, yes. Okay. We have lost the war on drugs. We yeah. did. Did we do more damage than good? Would you say, is it more damage than good? Or would you say it's not really any much of a difference, good or bad? It's really that much of it's good or bad. However, I believe that, you know, the, a government's main responsibility is to protect its citizens. That should be government's number one priority. But by being lax on crime and by not going after the drug manufacturers that are producing these very dangerous drugs on one hand, and I go in after the major drug cartels. I don't think we've gone after them as, as, as aggressively as we should, Patrick. I think that these cartels that are operating out of Mexico, operating out of China, um, I think we should really go after them because they are becoming stronger, bolder, and they are actually controlling their governments in those countries. I mean, there's no secret. The, the, the cartels are in control of the Mexican government. When yep. the Mexican government and the Mexican soldiers arrest Chapo Guzman's son and the cartels tell the Mexican government, or oh, you release him or we'll kill all of you guys, and they release him, what does that tell us? Weak. Plato Pluma, right? Plato Pluma. Exactly. Yeah. So Silver, basically, Silver that, at that point, you know, I think we, we should do something. Look at the LeBron massacre, where the Sinaloa cartel mm -hmm. executed nine family members that were traveling from the U.S. to attend a, a wedding in Mexico. They burned three American babies that were in baby, cha uh, baby chairs. They lit fire to the cars, shot and killed six kids and three uh, three ladies, adults. There was no males in the, in the uh, adult males in the convoy. That's a time we should do something. No, what, is, what, what, what do we do? We go to the Mexican government and say, hey, what are you going to do about the LeBron family massacre? Uh, we need to do something about it. We need to go out there and take on the cartels. What does the president of Mexico answer? No, we don't want to do a war against the cartels. Damn, We're going to save the drug problem here with abrazos, not balazos. That was his answer. Yeah. yeah. We're going We're gonna to hug these cartels. We're not going to get uh, shoot at them, okay? What kind of an answer is that? How the hell does that make any sense? It doesn't make any sense. So that's yeah. what the president of Mexico, Lopez Obrador, answered to our president here, who said he suggested that we send Marines and SEALs in and do away with the cartels. He was so upset. Well, I don't think we should invade other people's countries. I, you know, I think we ought to really look at how we reduce people wanting to use drugs in our own country, and in addition, be smart on crime and do strategic policing. I, you know, it's, again, this, you know, this is a nuanced, complex problem that the violence in Mexico, I think, is directly attributed to our policies for many years. Drug prohibition has done this. We saw this with alcohol prohibition, you know, and, and so... I had a, I pulled a quote from August Volmar, who was the police chief that professionalized policing out of California in Berkeley. This, he was on the Wickersham Commission, this is like the early 1900s. He was the father of policing. And still today, the International Association of the Chiefs of Police has a, a famous August Volmer Forensic Award. He started fingerprinting and beat cops and traffic cops and required cops to have bachelor's degrees. I mean, he was really cutting edge back then. And he said this about drugs. Like prostitution and like liquor, drug use 
was not a police problem. It has never been and never can be solved by the policeman. And I think that that quote really ascribes to the complexities of morality policing. In some aspects, the United States, a lot of our policing is based around morality and not around empirical evidence and how best to merge science and health and strategic policing to encourage community health and safety. Com complex, isn't it? Well, you know, for me, you know, I had, uh, uh, my dad told me, you go to prison once, you're going to go twice. I said, tell me why. He says, because you're going to school. That's why. That's right. You're going to school. When you go to prison, you're going to learn how to get creative and commit other crimes. That's Correct. all it is. It's a university. It's for yeah. crime. I agree with that. And that's why he meant you're going to go back. Not the fact that a man cannot change. Correct. It's the fact that a man is going to a place to be trained on, just like you put a man in a group. So... To me, you know, it always goes to the same thing to me. I, look, inner cities is where uh, drug dealers uh, uh, focus on, right? And you said you're in court with your brother and you look around, everybody is brown or black, right? And, you know, you know uh, that they're using that. I mean, you look at drugs, me being where I was at, I saw who was using drugs. The stats on crack cocaine, 55% of usage of crack cocaine is whites. However, the black American, African American population is 12.2%. But it's 35.8 percent usage, which is three and a half times the white. So why are drug dealers targeting certain groups and ethnicities? Why are they going after certain groups? Is it what is it for? Is it lack of education? Is it lack of support? Is it lack of why target that? Are they in a target that's easily I, to persuade? I, I, think, I think no, not at all. I think socioeconomic factors um, are the result of so much of that. Um, you know, poverty, class, um, education, over enforcement. Like, you know, law enforcement has over policed communities of colors for years because it maybe was easier for us. You know, drugs are still, we arrest more people for drugs in our country than we do for property crime or violent crime or rapes. You know, and, and so I know from our history, and, and I, just talking about my policing experience, because it's much different than yours, Hector, and, you know, big kudos to what you've done, and I think policing's an absolute noble profession, right? Is, but we tend to um, use the easiest way to solve a problem versus looking at strategic issues long-term. And what's forced us to do that is not that police officers are lazy in any way, shape, or form, is that politicians put too much on law enforcement to solve. And back to your point, you know, it's the politicians that need to enact policies that should have outcome studies to see if that law works, right? You know, is what we're doing effective? How better do we assess our economic policies and our education policies and everything else? What, I, what I've seen is that the poor people, the people that live in the ghettos and in the barrios, okay, are more susceptible to using drugs because they don't have money to go to vacation in Hawaii. They don't have money to go vacation in the Bahamas. Their form of escape, escaping their poverty, their suffering, is through drug use. That's their vacation. Trauma. And after a while, they take too many vacations and they become addicted. So it, I saw it. When I was undercover, I would see drug addicts come to the drug dealer that I was trying to buy heroin from, offering his wife to have sex with a drug dealer because he needed a fix and he didn't have money. I saw that. And I thought, this is crazy. Trauma. But, but I think that's, a, that's the other big issue is, is we have a lot of trauma in our societies in many different ways. Um, I, you know, recently read a study about, because there's, you know, let's talk about an uptick in violence in, in the last year and what's causing that. And um, I can't remember what the researcher was. Um, that basically really ascribes some of, of the uptick in violence to an uptick in drug market violence, right? Uh, maybe it was a study out of uh, Philadelphia in, in particular, but, you know, we don't 
treat trauma very well in our society, and some of it has to do, I think, with the American philosophy of, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstrap. And not everybody can do that. And, you know, there are policies in our country that have created systemic criminal justice issues. We over-police communities of color. You know, we've redlined them. Um, there's poverty. There's lack of health care, uh, access, disparities. There's a lack of grocery stores and good food. You know, we take that for granted sometimes. You know what it, what it makes me think about? Here's what it makes me think about. When I was coming up and uh, my parents got a divorce and we got nothing, it, it was almost as if the political leaders looked at me and felt sorry for me, and they felt that that's all I have and that's where I can belong. Here's some food stamp. Here's some lunch ticket. I'm a lunch ticket kid. I grew up with lunch tickets. I grew up with food mm -hmm. stamps. I'm the guy that would go to a welfare office in Glendale right by Rafi's place, and I would pick up the stuff and come back, and we'd be in lines. But I wonder if some of these politicians even want to help the poor get out of the poor into middle income without the government assistance on helping them to realize you also got dreams. You can go out there and do some special. Dream doesn't mean being a millionaire. Dreams means you creating a small little business or having a little job that you're doing good for yourself. Why not? Why don't politicians try to educate people on how to manage their finances, how to get better with money, how to get better with certain mindsets, how to address some of the generational curses that families have been dealing with, whether it's drugs, gambling, alcohol, gangs, you know, uh, abuse in families with marriage, with women. These are, these are things that continue happening, and it's a certain level of limiting beliefs on certain communities that you buy into. I'm Armenian. I'm supposed to be this. I'm a Syrian. I'm supposed to be this. Sure. I'm Mexican. I'm Salvadorian. So MS-13. I'm black. Yeah. I got to be this. I'm this. I, it's so much of those limiting beliefs inje in injected constantly affirmations on the, on the community that you're like, this is my identity. No, it's not. You have so, to ask the politicians. <laughs> that's, that's where it goes. So that's where it Great goes. Point. I, exactly. Great point. That's where it goes because, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what it is to be raised in a rich family where you can pick and choose what university you've got. None of us do here, right? No. We, we I grew up poor. Up. Yeah, so, right. so, so the idea is to get you out, not stay in. I wonder if sometimes politicians want to get you out or keep you to get your damn vote every four years or every two years. Yeah. There's certain people that also, this whole term limit stuff, that we got people stay in politics for 40 years. I don't trust people that are in politics more than 20 years. I have a very hard time trusting people in politics more than there. 20 years. I think term limits. Tenure, I think everybody somehow should give back to their country through church, charity, politics, and service. Choose one of those. Sure. Give back. But maybe go be a councilman. Maybe go be something for two, four years, eight years. Leave. Yeah. Go do your thing. This is how it used to be. Now it's career. Career. Now it's let me go land a best-selling book, and because of that, let me give up this other free thing, and communities get hurt, and the division continues happening. Lobbyists behind closed doors are getting laws being passed for the these big companies that money. can allow. Yeah, so, so I, 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 think, I think you're right. I think it is the politicians um, that are in charge of the policies they create to be held accountable to. Yep. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, it makes sense where we come from. You know, the hard part is all three of us, in many aspects, share probably a lot of similarities. And, but the other thing we share is luck also. And, and I think that, that for a lot of people in our society, sometimes there is no luck. We, you know, we, we managed. You know, I had a successful career. I'm the executive director. I do a lot of great stuff. You know, publish the book. Everybody, go out and buy a book. Right. <laughs> it's a great book. Um, you know, you look where you're at. And I think we have to account for both our hard work and our luck sometimes. But I, I will tell you this, okay? Even if that, would you say majority of it is hard work? Yes. You cannot tell me it's eighty percent luck, twenty percent hard work. I think it's yeah. I'm not. I'm not discounting yeah. that at all. But I also think it was a different era when we grew up. Like, you know, law enforcement. You know, the the sergeant who hired me was also the sergeant who chased me back when I was a teenager. What a great story! Right? No, it was. It was. It was, it was absolutely hilarious. Sick. It was. That's you know, great. You know, but. The criminal justice system yeah. and the interventions were much different back then. You know, like, you know, 
there was much more of the recognition of, you know, people make mistakes. And you know, we should have second chances. You mean we're, we're more forgiven? Yes, we, we were. As a, we as a society should, I believe, identify those that are addicted to drugs, identify them, and try to get in some help. Think of all the children that grow up with addict moms, absent fathers, okay? What future do they have? Seriously, I think we need... As a, as a society to identify all of the people that are suffering from drug abuse. Stop arresting them. Stop harassing them. Let's try to get them some help. My libertarian tendencies kind of cringe when Seriously, I hear that, because, right? Seriously, because think of, the, think of the suffering of the children. No, I get, I get it, but I still have these libertarian tendencies where it's like, you know what, that's not what America, we can't identify people because we're really bad on putting people on lists. <laughs> and not treating people but who I'm are saying on the list really to help well. them, not, not to I, arrest yeah, them or I know, harass but, them. But we, uh, yeah, I just, I think that I think that there's there's non-coercive ways of being able to give people access to public health interventions that are more beneficial than putting them on a list. But that, but I don't disagree with the intent. I, I you're right. Well, you know? you know, for the, I think the audience won today, uh, folks, if you're watching this, I'm actually curious. I'm going to read your commentary. If you can comment below how you would fix it, like what are some of your ideas? Really, I'm curious. What are some of your ideas on how to address, address this? Is it on the family? Is it on the community? Is it on the politician? Is it on law enforcement? Is it state? Is it federal level? Who is it? Is it corporations? Who is the one that it starts off with? And then who do we go all the way up to? to hold accountable uh, uh, with these issues that we're having with drugs. Hector, thank you for taking the time and flying out here. Dan, you as well. This was fantastic. Uh, it was great hearing your point and yours and also hearing where you guys agree as well. Um, I have a feeling this conversation is going to continue. It's not going to go away, Absolutely. especially in the next few years. Thank you. This is going to become an issue, but uh, it was great having you guys on. Thank you for Thank having me. Oh, pleasure. It was, it was really enjoyable. Nice meeting I you. I told you I'd charm you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> have a good one, folks. We'll see you guys next week. Take care. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye.